exciting to have you back for another episode, which happens to be the 266 uh, for our show, Human Humane Architecture here on Think Tech Hawaii. And you are about to be our 14,320th accumulated viewer. So thank you for that. So we jump right in and get the first picture up uh, because last week we sent me to the big island to check on there and see how the balance between the beautiful <laughs> natural and the men and hopefully in the future increasingly women uh, made uh, a built environment is. And we went to Kilauea that was having fun and uh, spouting out magma. And we went to the project that is the closest to that, which is the Mauna Kea Beach Resort Hotel and also the Mauna Lani down the coast. And they get pretty close to that. But then uh, this slide, uh, when I flew back to our island and it's not very visible, but the top slender piece up there is our panoramic out of the airplane where you see uh, that in addition to the green uh, natural mountains, there is in this case predominantly white or beige as the preferred color here for some odd reasons, there is a built mountain uh, uh, line here. This, these are high rises and this project here, I, I just we just can't hide because the picture at the bottom right has been floating around for quite some while that is supposed to be the most, uh, the newest uh, Kamehameha school high rise in Kaka'ako. And it was now uh, in this uh, you know, uh, Hawaiian Airlines magazine, Hanaho, with the rendering to the left. And um, DeSoto and uh, Matt, who are with us today, uh, DeSoto from his Bishop Museum here in Honolulu, Hawaii, as always. And uh, Matt Noblet in Boston, Massachusetts, with us today. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Hello. So, Matt, uh, you've been visiting us uh, quite a bit over the last couple of years and decades. And uh, as we will find out soon, you're an expert in many things and also come from <laughs> Paul Buildings as an experience. How does this one here look to you guys? <sighs> I mean, it's always difficult to judge without, you know, judging a book by its cover is probably an unfair thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think this definitely raises, I mean, always the question is what distinguishes this from, you know, a tower of a similar type here in downtown Boston or, you know, downtown Houston or, or anywhere else. I, I, uh, I'd be really, you know, it seems like it, it could you could make something of those dimensions work potentially but does it really work like that i i find myself a bit skeptical but i you know certainly would certainly would would welcome more information <laughs> <laughs> that's fair to say and the soda you and i had been you know a bit more trained and a little bit less uh patient i guess over the years but i think Matt, your point is right on i think this looks like could be a boston high rise because yeah. It is, it has a glass envelope. So if that's triple pane, which you need these days, it would probably mm -hmm. keep you warm in the winter time to come soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, in recognition of these, you know, few summer months where it's also very nice outside, you could go outside on these, we probably can call them balconies and not yet Lanai is the solar, right? Yeah, and uh, I think, again, I, I just, I agree with what Matt said. It's hard to judge in this particular case, but. Basically, it comes down to the thing that you, Martin, and I are, are always talking about, and the livability of high rises in Honolulu really depends upon one being able to open the windows or open sliding doors, and two having a lanai. And the whole mm -hmm. point is, as as Matt knows very well, you live in a very hostile environment for much of the year, and we live in a very loving environment for most of the year, <laughs> and so what. We need to take advantage of our environment to not only make our lives better in these buildings, but also to save energy. And that's a really basic thing that everybody needs to do all over the world. Yeah, I'm I'm always uh, I, when I think about, I mean, 25 years of being in Hawaii at all different times of the year. Um, the only times I've ever been uncomfortable have been inside of man-made interventions of one sort <laughs> or another. 
I mean, and then you think to yourself, what are we doing here, right? When the least comfortable place is something that we inflicted upon ourselves. Yeah. And it's right over, it's either, it's, a, it's an over-conditioned uh, office building or it's a, it's a house or a, a, some building that doesn't have the right dimensions to, to ventilate properly. To be, I mean, why would you even think about doing stuff like this in a place like Hawaii that's effectively like a para, you know, it's literally built for human inhabitation, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I, I, and I could just add too, Matt, I, I work in Bishop Museum, so it's always cold inside, and that's why I have on a jacket, but it has to be cold inside because we're taking care of objects that need to be kept in certain climatic conditions. So mm -hmm. I have to adapt myself to what's best for the things that are being cared for. But in a home, you don't need to do that. In an apartment, you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and I, I really, with respect for you guys saying, you know, unless we have more information, we don't want to get more critical, but I go ahead and say, okay, sorry, we probably, there's little doubt that when we see the plan, we see confirmed that this is a double loaded corridor building, right? From its width, it's very mm -hmm. likely. And that is wrong to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. Mid-century mm -hmm. modernism that we all appreciate had a single loaded corridor. That's basically the one to do. And then glass as very likely fixed glazing, especially the front end that is facing the ocean for the views. That is where the sun sets. That is baking you, unless you mm -hmm. have that AC behind. So I, I have to say, sorry already. I think this is, they put this kind of texture sprinkle on. And as we talked before the show, texture, I think, is very inherent for the tropics because in the tropics, everything needs to spread out uh, as architecture should do. And in the tempered, both in Boston and in Munich, where, by the way, you are going right after this show, jumping into the airplane and going there, you need to basically, you know, tuck yourself down and, 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 and decrease your surface relative to your, to your volume. That's the mm -hmm. way to do it. Nature does it. Even our cells do it. Animals do it. Birds do it. And architecture need to do this too. So it's very, very likely sort of a nicely kind of camouflaged as textured building that is more or less a invasive hermetic. Um, and we also read exclusive building once again, right? The first, mm -hmm. their first uh, basically sales pitch is a sustainably, and that one we question all the things mm -hmm. we just basically said, and then designed luxury high rise. So the question is the Soto, you being from here and this being your culture and Kamehameha School representing your culture, is that what you guys need more of luxury? Well, no, not truly, no. I can understand the idea of having a sort of a portfolio, if you will, of different buildings for different levels of your economy, so that because and, and Kamehameha Schools does need to produce income to keep the school going. So there is a place for all kinds of development within its holdings. But at the same time, for the Hawaiian people, no, luxury developments are not needed as much as affordable developments are needed. And so we do see that, of course, different districts of Honolulu have different levels of economic development and economic uh, clout. So yes, there are luxury areas and there are low income areas as well. But basically, yeah, we don't need necessarily more luxury condos for Hawaii's presidents. We need more affordable ones. Yeah. Whenever I see something like this, I always find myself asking if I didn't do anything else to alter the architecture, but I just didn't make the, that central corridor that you're sure exists. And I think you're right. What if that, if that why does that have to be interior space? in Hawaii, right? Only because the expectation of, a, of somebody who can pay for the top floor here is that from the place where they park their car till their front door, they're in an interior environment. But that in and of itself would be such a huge improvement, right? There's a great hotel in Austin that I stayed in a couple of weeks ago called the Carpenter Hotel. And it's essentially a kind of standard hotel plan, if you can imagine that. But um, th there's, no, there's no enclosure to the hallways anywhere. So like, right away you've created a very uh, you've, you've embraced the kind of the local environment 
and you've reduced the volume that you have to condition because they still condition the rooms, obviously, you know, nobody would stand for that probably in Austin, but it, it, it seems to me like such a simple thing that makes a yeah. huge difference. So yeah. you get to your rooms on the exterior, there's an exterior walkway, like a, like a, a short, a small walk up. No, it's actually like in, in that very, in that building we're looking at, it's not that tall and nearly that tall, but imagine that there just wasn't any glass at the end of the corridor. You okay, just looked down okay. the corridor and it was All open, right. right? And breezes flow okay. through there and the humidity is in yeah. there. And you actually feel like you've gone outside when you step outside your front door That's... rather than oh. hermetically sealed. Uh, yeah, yeah. As it is the way in where we are broadcasting from, from my end here, which is the Grand Hotel in Waikiki, the Grand Waikiki Grand Hotel, <laughs> that is, is by not, not all that grand to be <laughs> Well, it's very <laughs> inclusive and diverse yeah. and lots of things. And it was yeah. designed by Ernest Hara, who uh, then is the father of John Hara, who is the father of Mayumi Hara and their great intergenerational team, as is the office, uh, Matt, that you joined and are representing uh, here on the show, Banish, as with Gunther and Stefan. And uh, here, the grandfather designed it in exactly the same way. Um, there's, there's, there's two wings, and one wing is single-loaded corridor, where the developers then say, okay, that's less you know, economical, and there is some mm -hmm. truth to that, right? But mm -hmm. the other wing that I'm on uh, is exactly as you describe it. It's open to the single-loaded corridor, and then open, very open to the other side. So... Again, fire rating quite uh, quite problematic, as we know from the Marco Polo building and the fire here. But I often have a piece of wood in my door, as to get that cross breeze through, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a great transition to the next slide, please, because as you just said, uh, Matt, little tweaks could make a big difference. And that's what I thought when I put this here together, which is a compilation of show quotes from last week my little intro to the Banish legacy here, where I was just picking on two things. Uh, if you would use the ESO shuck, and you want to uh, quickly explain in your words, uh, uh, Matt, what that is? I mean, it's basically a, a piece of, the, the, the impolite way would be to say, if you took like a beer cooler and stuck rebar through it uh, to, to break the, um, the thermal bridge on a, on a concrete slab from inside to outside so that there's no transmission of, of thermal energy from inside to outside or loss uh, of, of, of uh, heat. That's essentially what it is. And it's used everywhere in Germany to build, you know, exterior balconies on, particularly on housing projects. But basically, you know, we use it, uh, we use it all over the place to eliminate the thermal bridge. Exactly. And while these two dots on top of the O are suspicious of, again, being from <laughs> Germany, but if you Google for that, there is an American representative, you know, there is a, a, you can get it here. That's what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. And while, again, in, it's not quite as bad as it would be in Boston, and we've been, you know, analyzing Jeannie Gang's uh, recent um, high rise for Howard Hughes quite a bit. And we're really hoping and um, but um, I happen to be on my way in and out to Germany, what you're doing in an hour um, uh, at that time when I was still in the prairie and in the desert, Chicago was my hop in and out. So I saw the thing going up and I wish I would have seen that double line that indicates mm -hmm. that thermal break and it wasn't. And some years later, we toured the office with the students and I pulled another German worked in the office aside because I didn't want to embarrass him in front of everyone. And I said, please, have I just not seen it? And he said, no, you're right. We have not used it. And imagine in Chicago, that's a radiator reverse, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, It's yeah. just really bad. So here in the, in the tropics, the heat creeping in isn't quite as bad as in the cold, quite as detrimental, but still bad enough, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So yep. that using your idea with opening the corridor, using the ESO checks, and then one more thing that I've been remembering in the last show that is very Banishy that has to do with Banish and here, what building component product is that? The jealousies, I guess. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you guys tell us more about the jealousies from your point of view. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of a very, I mean, I, I, actually I'm probably more familiar with it from Hawaii, right? Because every, even our family house in, in Kailua has, you know, jealousies pretty much in every window opening 
but um, it is a really nice way to open up a huge amount of free area in a window opening using just glass lamella, basically that wrote that pivoted either at the middle point or at one of the, at the edges uh, to kind of open the thing up and and obviously gives it a nice a nice texture right when they're closed you see this kind of shingling effect of the glass and then they just all sort of flip open and you get you know good natural ventilation uh, through the building. Um, yeah, great yeah. product. And it's and it's funny as you you know being sort of a hybrid between the two my two cultures the German and the American <laughs> by now. I come from the from the other end here uh, in remembering it from my early years as a teenager and then starting into architecture that Günther Benisch was a big fan of the jealousies and all the early projects that's in there. And I revisited our former capital, which I wish it would be still ours uh, because it's much better than the one that Foster redid the Reichstag, uh, the one in Bonn. And I went there, the picture is on the bottom left and the top right is from me revisiting it in the spring, this spring. And then the top right, you see, and it's, well, you can't see really entrance because that's the point. There isn't really one entrance. That's, but that one side facing actually the city and not the river, the whole mm -hmm. front is, is glass jealousy. And mm -hmm. the main manufacturer company is called Glassball Han. They got this red rooster as their logo because Han is rooster. <laughs> they, although this sort of energy efficiency paranoia that the German culture went through, you would think they had to get rid of the thing, right? Because a single mm. pane glass jealousy that works here does not work in freaking cold, especially not now without Putin's gas increasingly <laughs> less, right? This winter, mm. first time. Yep. And yeah. so they did not give up on it. They, I, I was so uh, thrilled to see that they basically stubbornly uh, uh, basically made it into a triple pane, an uh, argon-filled mm -hmm. version, and here is a version that has no frame around it, so it's all glazed. Mm -hmm. It's the so the frameless version of it. And yeah, I just yeah. thought, okay, if you just keep the same design that we previously seen, we open the corridor, your suggestion, we give it the ISO shucks, and we all clad it with the tire mo, as they call that project, project. Mm. And then, you know, it's a compromise because people here in the summers, when I remember here and uh, people tell me it's a little bit too hot. And in these few times they run their AC, at least they keep that pressures and, you know, expensively generated cold inside and it's not mm -hmm. leaking outside again. But at the other month, most months, as you the solo correctly remind us of the year, you just have them open. And, you know, talking, I think this is all technology, right? And technology is one thing, but I think we want to switch to talking about philosophy and that get us to the next slide. But I'm thinking even that you were talking about the aesthetics of it, Matt, right? Rightly so, and the beauty of it, uh, because you have a building that's all of a sudden biodynamic, right? Once mm -hmm. it's closed, it's just like the bird that we we're talking about before. It tucks down its feathers and looks way more compact. And when it starts to aerate itself and spreads out mm -hmm. the feathers, it looks, looks more feathery and airy. And that's what the building that would do aesthetically, right? Mm -hmm. as, a, mm -hmm. as a result of its performance and not the other way around. Right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I, this is, for, for me, it's a really interesting topic. It, it, it always struck me that if, you know, we talk about kind of, big developments in architecture, whether that was in, you know, structure or steel framing, or there was always a kind of a corresponding um, architectural response, right? A new language that developed. And it seems to me like if we're talking about sustainable buildings, they should look different than the ones that we've, that we're used to seeing that maybe aren't as sustainable. And I'm not sure I've seen, I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to claim that we've found that language or that solution ourselves yet but um it's it's something that really preoccupies us which is are we really deciding how the building should look based on pure formal um, um criteria or are we allowing um the the kind of the inherent nature of the building and the way it wants to perform to in a sense kind of inform um the architecture right what does this actually what does sustain what should sustainable architecture really look like in some ways um so yeah, and, yeah i mean go ahead. and i think i think what you're saying and this you know the the picture that you threw in there at the top left 
well, actually, you know, from here on, all the pictures are from you. And I, I think what you're talking about is different than obviously in this image. Uh, you, well, you're not talking gadgety to begin with, but you're also talking in a sort of inherently integrated way, right? And not in exactly. a sort of an add-on and thrown-on way. And we will, I think the sort of we should ask Matt, which we do now, if we could use this here in our other ongoing show, whenever, and that happens quite frequently, we get so tired about architecture and you know the <laughs> getting stuck in it we need to get out and we get we have a show going on that's called the mobile and the immobilia so mm. it's about cars and architecture and it's mm -hmm. it's the same there right that now while it's great to have electric cars more and more but they just throw that technology into the same body styles right Versus like the, uh, and like Musk is doing that more or less. Well, he designed the new or had the Mazda guy design it new from scratch. But then there were the Aptera guys who were actually ahead of him technologically. And they said, no, we need to make this car that actually, if you cover it all with thin film PV, it never has to see a gas station, not even an electric recharging run one. And that made that car having to totally rethink itself in its whole anatomy, right? Mm -hmm, and that's mm -hmm. why for the general public, and that's why Musk playing it safe, being the businessman <laughs> said, no, I'm not going that extreme, right? That's going to limit me in my, in, my, in my economics, right? But they, and luckily these guys are back and you can now back on their feet, they went to do other things. So I think it's the same kind of thing. And the other comparison mm -hmm. you make here between the gadgets and the, and the gestalt, right? Yeah, and I mean, obviously, you know, no matter how many green technologies you bolt onto a Hummer, the core problem still persists, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I think the other image here, um, kind of, a, I provoke you with this about where you come from. So you're, um, the way we get you here is uh, also, and not also, but mainly through Bundet that you went to school with, and you both went mm -hmm. to MIT and got your mm -hmm. master's from there. And uh, you, then you worked for several, you know, offices, and one of them was Rafael Vignoli here, right? And Vignoli, right, right. Uh, we've been with the emerging generation um, always uh, recently uh, looking into skinny towers, but again, skinny towers in in Honolulu for a, for a different reason because the bamboo grove being an inspiration or a raw model, right? You see the bamboo plants growing just as close to each other as they need to be to shade each other, but mm -hmm. they are as spaced out as they still get sun, rain, and wind and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so that mm -hmm. way, you know, a skinny tower in the tropics, having a, a small footprint allows you to be aerated from all sides. So we came from a sort of a tropical performative angle to be interested in skinny towers, while Vignoli came from a, if I'm not mistaken, a more formal approach, right? And then there's this TikTok lady out there, a TikTok teenager who rants about it and she she hates it and uh, and goes up against it. And of course, there's unfortunate things as lawsuits and you know uh, liability issues in the buildings. And we don't want to, you know, I think he's already devastated enough as this picture I pulled from the web shows, right? But <laughs> what I wanted to throw out is again your own uh, experience as a transition <clears throat> from probably the more formal. To the more performative it's yeah yeah i mean it's kind of like as you and i spoke about before the show you know we we or i certainly i was very much brought up in the kind of formal slash conceptual kind of um school of architecture which is a very much a heritage of modernism right the notion that you could the idea that we could build the same building or build anything anywhere uh and only use you know kind of theoretical formal kind of cri criteria to make make judgments it's a very limiting um frame with which to analyze architecture um but it was the dominant one at the time and i think um you know certainly i mean i i i worked at rafael's office for almost almost nine years and and i learned so much there right about so many things um but i think as as i kind of came towards the end of my time there there was something it, you know the, the the time was changing too and the 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 culture was changing and and you know these issues of of how, what you know the ethics around what we're building and why we build a certain way were becoming much more prevalent and so 
I think I was looking for a different way to um, think about architecture and these different in, in a different filter through which to analyze it or critique it or in fact design it. Yeah. Um, and that kind of, you know, it ultimately kind of led to where where I am today and have been for the last 17 years, I guess. But, um, yeah, that, yeah. you know, we're all products of where, of where we came from and our experiences. And, um, and, and so, you know, like I said, there's so the problem is, in a way, there's so much basic knowledge you have to accumulate as an architect, right? Just how you make anything stand up and work uh, before you even can begin to refine it and think about it and, and kind of more progressive terms um yeah it's 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 a challenge yeah and although we only have two minutes left let's get the next slide up there because that's <laughs> i think perfectly fitting there and before the show i was like i think overly exaggerating and saying you know you guys are trying the absence <laughs> of ego and you said well one would wish there would be such a thing but that's probably then you know, the topic, the title of the show is human humane. That's probably against human nature. So you need to have certain amount of ego, but you need to keep it, I think, um, you know, confined within, you know. And so I, you know, when um, this is, this is your, your firm, this is your colleagues. And as I was sharing last time, when I wanted to get um, Martin Haas to speak when I was still in the prairie, Mm. And I, I called the office. Uh, it was Utah picking up the office, the, the telephone. Uh, and I Utah found Hines. out, yeah. So I found out uh, there is no such thing as a secretary. Because yeah. why would you want a secretary while everyone can be the secretary for a week, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. just like reminds me of the American academe and the German academe where, you know, in Germany, there is no such thing as what an American dean is. Because mm -hmm. everyone, and that really keeps the egos in place, because if you're the dean for a year in Germany, you better watch out you don't piss people off because it bites you back the next year, right? You know, we don't, we don't even have, we don't have personal emails in the office. There's only project emails. So, you know, if we were, if we're doing a project, say, at, I don't know, Harvard University, it's, it's like harvard at banish.com. And everybody's email software points to that address so everybody sees every email that gets uh, sent to the office or gets sent out and the the reasoning is very simple is that you can't have a you can't have a, a non-hierarchical organization if everybody doesn't have the same information right information is power is is a dangerous thing i think that now i don't think it has but it, it is the perfect closing note for today <laughs> and obviously since we only made it uh through three slides and we have 53 <laughs> so this makes for many more shows that we look much forward to matt uh, Likewise. Thanks, for, thanks for kicking this off um i have a safe flight now in an hour and, thank you uh, thank you i'll you, see you in a week you, have you back exactly in a week and until then you all stay very democratically people and planet friendly Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.